it's, why isn't this saying? There we go. So just uh, for all the new folks, here's a little rundown of our meeting structure. We're going to have our various working groups, um, tech, outreach, et cetera, um, do a little stand up and present what they've been working on. Um, please, if you have any questions, we kindly ask that you save those until the end. We will have a Q&A session at that point. And uh, we'll try to keep the comments to 45 seconds, but historically, um, it's been pretty flexible as we've had plenty of spare time and we've been pretty much, pretty much respectful of the boundaries of what we're trying to do here. And after the meeting is over, we also have, will have our humanity hangs. These are done in the second and fourth Sunday of every month. So on the second is just simply humanity hang and tonight will just be done, we will be happening after the meeting. What it simply is, it's just a very casual hang. If you were talking with us a couple of minutes ago before the meeting started, you're aware it was just a way to kick back, relax, reconnect with all your awesome, all these awesome California people, especially in this time of isolation where everyone could always use someone to talk to and someone to listen to. So um, if anything, the links to the slides are on the chat. And let's get started. The agenda today, key players, Humanity First Day, exciting about that one, strategic partnerships, our candidate spotlight, COVID relief, uh, California mission and vision, California org structure, our tech team, and how to connect and stay in touch with us. So a lot happening here in California. So just a quick rundown to familiar, so familiarize yourself with the lay of the land. Um, there are many, now mostly three key players. And if we could all go on mute real quick so as to not incidentally um, muffle up the, the audio over here. But we have three key players. First and foremost is Humanity Forward. This is Andrew's nonprofit that he launched shortly after the conclusion of this campaign to help continue pushing his ideals, of course, forward as much as possible. We also have the Humanity First Movement. So kind of think of them as like the national grassroots organizers, mostly make up the super volunteers, previous regional organizers, et cetera, trying to build a national infrastructure so as we can all coordinate and work together. And then we have the California Yang Gang, which is us. Now we are of course still looking to push the Humanity First values, candidates and policies for California. And uh, we run our own initiatives. As you guys remember during the campaign, California was always leading in a lot of different ways and we always want to tap into the creative energy of the Yang Gang over here. And we are in discussions right now for uh, rebranding as one of the important things that we're trying to push for is reminding people that as much as Andrew did a fantastic job pushing this movement forward, it has always been at, to all of us, it's always, it always been up to all of us at the end of the day to push it as far as we can. So we're trying to change it simply from a following to the movement that it actually always has been. So stay tuned for that. And if you'd like to get involved, there'll be links for more of that at the conclusion. So first and foremost, we have Humanity First Day and I'll pass it along to Jess for that. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm Jess, I'm based in Sacramento. Um, and Humanity First Days are something that we really love. Uh, we started doing them during the Yang campaign days, sort of as a way to give back to our communities and really like speak truth to our values. Um, and Humanity First Days are great because local organizations can plan their own community service events, whether that's setting up a food pantry or doing trash pickup, helping Habitat for Humanity, planting trees. There are a lot of different options um, and there are options for uh, even the pandemic where you can do something outside that's relatively safe. So um, we're really excited to have uh, our next Humanity First Day on August 15th, um, which is a Saturday. We have a Facebook page, which you'll find at the bottom of this slide. So you can go and um, coordinate with people there, but we would encourage you to think up your own event um, and then, you know, coordinate with your local gang gangs and see if you guys can, um, you know, all, all put something together. Um, so this will be really fun. We really hope everyone participates. And even if you are by yourself, if you just want to do something good for your community, um, you know, go post it on social media, hashtag it, Humanity First Day, um, and hopefully there will be many more of these to come. Awesome, awesome. Yes, we're very excited about that. Humanity First Day is among my favorite things through during the campaign. I look forward to seeing what we can accomplish with this one. Up next, we have strategic partnerships with Kimberly, AKA K Woods, take it away. Hey y'all, welcome, welcome. My name is Kimberly, I'm down in San Diego. Nice to meet y'all. And um, I'm here representing Income Movement and they are one of our strategic partnerships. 
um, and we work with them a lot. Um, we have a mutually beneficial um, endeavor with um, our basic income um, uh, championship uh, and um, one of the base one of the big couple of the big projects that um, they are working on right now is um, the basic income March, which is happening on September 19th. And then also um, we're pressuring Congress for an emergency UBI. Um, you can find that um, uh, plugin at bailoutthepeople.com. And also if you wanna check out the website for the basic income March, that link is down there as well. Um, I, pilled, I built out a little one pager to give you some info on some of the task forces that they have right now. You can find that on this link as well and um, some information on how to get plugged in through their uh, volunteer network. And also um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions or, or comments or, or want any information on what it means to get involved with the Basic Income March. And um, we can all work together to make a big splash on September 19th together. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you very much, Kimberly. Kimberly. And it is my pleasure to introduce for our candidate spotlight this month, Assembly Member Evan Lowe. Evan, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, thank you very much. Hopefully you can see me okay. Yes. How are you? Um, so, um, well, I can do a quick introduction or you can go with your introduction if you'd like. <laughs> please go ahead. Yeah, so Evan Lowe, for those that don't know, was um, the national co-chair for Andrew's campaign. After the campaign concluded, he introduced the California UBI bill into the California Assembly and is currently running back for re-election for state assembly. And we are super thrilled to have him today. And uh, Evan, what would you like to um, share with us tonight, how, how we can get involved in your campaign? And more importantly, what ways on a local level can Californians do to actually change the conversation and move our, our policies forward? Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. And it's good to see all of you uh, here and seeing the continued energy that we have, not only after an campaign, but with respect to the issue that we collectively care about because uh, this is important that we have a sustained effort uh, to focus on the things that we really are passionate about. And particularly in California, I think there's a great amount of uh, individuals who are uh, apolitical or apathetic with respect to engagement. And or we think that we're in California, so everything must be taken care of. When in fact, you can see how important it is for us to be engaged. Uh, but maybe just some context and some background, because I think it's also important that we are informed about how we can hold our elected representatives accountable and understand the institution of the state political apparatus to deliver for the things that we care about. So just very quickly on, for example, universal basic income and the legislation that was previously introduced that I passed along in the legislature earlier this year. Now, any legislature any legislator can introduce a piece of legislation. Unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, our ambitions were uh, had to be lessened with respect to uh, tapering down our ambitions. So because of the significant fiscal cost in the state of California, the fiscal committee did not necessarily want to see this bill. In other words, we started California this calendar year with close to $20 billion with a surplus, $20 billion surplus. Unfortunately, just fast forward five or six months later due to the COVID pandemic, we are now in a $54 billion deficit. So because of the challenges on the basic fundamentals, uh, we were not able to look at a new program. Having said that, it's also increasingly clear, abundantly clear that we see that universal basic income has had an impact should it have been implemented some time ago. And you can see that while this concept and this idea was not new, it was often politicized in which now you see the federal representatives, Congress, continuing to tinker with such basic principles. So where there's a will, there's a way. So again, legislatively, we can pass legislation, but also share with you that there's an opportunity given people power, and that's where you come in. Similarly, we will be seeing close to 15 to 20 uh, propositions in November. The way that California takes a look at propositions is anyone 
can put something on the ballot for voters in California to decide. So should uh, this group and others desire in the very near future, for example, to put something on a ballot in California? It is the basic fundamentals of getting and collecting enough signatures so that the people can vote on it themselves. And can you imagine the type of people power and the focus of the energy that we'd have should that also become an opportunity? So multiple ways to get some of the issues that we care about accomplished and addressed. Uh, and certainly we want to encourage more individuals to embrace the, the policy to the best extent possible. So again, a call to action to ask your state legislator if you don't know who your state legislator is, there's multiple ways in which you can go online and find out via your zip code who your state legislator is and ask to meet with them, ask to meet with their staff, ask them to support your universal basic income and also ask, should they have some reservations about it, ask them why and what can we do collectively to get them in a comfortable place so they can support this key proposal in the state of California. So I'm encouraged by the opportunities that we have collectively by ensuring that we can continue to advance the issues that we care about, but also being engaged. Um, let me finally just say that I would, I've now been in public office as an elected official on city council and mayor and state assembly now uh, for close to 15 years. And I didn't want to do politics, uh, but uh, similarly as mayor for a city in Silicon Valley, uh, I can't afford to live on my full income. Uh, I served as mayor, but I can't live in the city that I represent or a state legislator, but I cannot afford uh, to own a home because the median income required to live in Silicon Valley is a whopping $275,000 a year. And you'd go to the average American and you tell them this and they would laugh you out. Um, but again, don't feel sorry for me, the, the elected representative or politician. And that's why we keep talking about rewriting the rules of the economy to work for everyone uh, that I also represent Cupertino, where Apple, the most valuable company in the world, resides. And yet in the Cupertino School District, they are in their sixth year of consecutive cuts. Now there's something wrong with this picture here. And that's why when we talk about California and the work that is required, we must make sure that we have our finger on the pulse and you are the cavalry to build this. And this is a people power movement. So again, let us continue to be energized and focus on how we can use our energy to engage and look at some winnable results in the very near future. So again, happy to be here and happy to have dialogue with you as well, because I'd also equally like to learn about the work that you're doing as well. Awesome, Evan, that was fantastic. I appreciate your enthusiasm as well. Um, so um, if you'd like, I'd like to open up to some questions for our attendees over here. And I'd like to particularly start off with asking, well, with asking of you, I usually find that there's a general disconnect that people see with um, local politics. Um, Andrew is of course easy to catch on to and support because the presidency is something that everyone focuses on once every four years. But with so a large percentage of the voting population never even voting, and I'm sure even those do, they probably go to the ballot box, see a presidential candidate, and then for the rest of the candidates kind of just maybe check off by party affiliation for the most part. So what would you say to the people that never really thought much about local politics, like how much of an effect it actually has on their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, for sure. Well, by way of background, again, I first ran for office when I was 20 years old. Uh, this was back in like 2003, 2004. And um, I'm fourth generation Californian, speaking more Spanish than I knew Chinese. Um, but I oftentimes talk about me seeing a, being seen as a perpetual foreigner, that I'm never truly American, uh, and or that I uh, had to think about looking at my elected representatives, but they were more prioritized on historic preservation, where I, where I was just so frustrated because I felt that the focus of the city budget should be on keeping people in their homes or attracting public servants like teachers and investing in our incredible institutions. Look, we know this, our state and our local budgets are a reflection of our values. So when we talk about the challenges and you think about more investment in California, for example, in corrections. Think about this, my fellow Californians. We are putting more money and in investing more in prisons than we are in building higher educational institutions. There is something fundamentally wrong with this picture. So how can we not be woke? How can we not be upset and angry? And think about this. When you, when you close your eyes and think about an average politician, 
you might conjure a particular notion that they might be affluent, that may be on the older generational scale. Well, that means that our priorities are very different and they feel like the system is currently working uh, because they're part of their system and or they benefited from the system. So that's why we need to be part of the conversation and be at the table. And there's no substitute for being at the table. And again, when I was on the city council in Campbell, I would sit around a room and I'd see a, a number of older people, multi-generations um, ahead of me. But if I was not at that table to be able to demand and talk about what are we doing? What is the voice of those on the millennial generation to encourage that of home ownership and our renters? And again, that was not a priority of previous generations. So we've come far away from the California and American dream, which is this of the social contract that everyone should be educated and has access to education. And that's what another distinct notion that there's something called the California Education Master Plan that was passed in 1960. Education was free. You think I'm crazy, but access to education in California was free. I'm not kidding you, take a look at it. it the reason because we want to lower barriers to entry to provide more Californians to have access to gain skill sets to become productive members of society. And so you fast forward to where we are today, now it's not four years, it's six years. The average graduation rate from the CSU in four years is a whopping 14%. 14% of students at the CSU, California State University system, graduate in four years. So when we think about the challenges of young, for young people, we have set up the young people up for failure, not for success. And when you think about that, just think about that. Our society and our systems are setting up everyday Californians for failure, not for success. So we need to change this and have dialogue around this to call it for what it is. And that's why representation is really important. And that we shouldn't think that politics is scary, it's dirty, um, or that, that it, the system doesn't work for me. We have to be part of that system. And you can see significant changes over a period of time. That is very well played, I agree. Change doesn't happen overnight, but it does take time. And that happens when we do, when we actively apply that pressure constantly. It's not just voting every four years. It is doing a lot of the social activism that we've seen over the past few weeks during the pandemic, especially like making your voices heard and knowing that, you know, in the case of, of the recent examples, you know, city budgets are dependent on the way mayors and city councils are allocated to them. And those are elected officials. Like you're not just voting for a party candidate, you're voting for the direction in which you want to drive your local communities. We have a question from Elaine in the chat. She says, what tips would you give for those who may be new to running for an elected seat or general elections um, and advice in general? Well, just advice in general is I think, um, again, do not be afraid of the system. Uh, it can be as simple as going to city hall and going to the city clerk and saying, I would like to get involved. Uh, or what are the appointments for boards and commissions, whether or not it's the police commission. These commissions in our cities are advisory. So oftentimes there are advisory commissions in which you're appointed by the mayor and or city council. Similarly, there's an opportunity to get involved in your local democratic clubs or democratic party. And so being present along that is very important and very helpful. So it's not as daunting as you might think. And the reality is that once you engage with everyone, you'll find that our, our elected representatives, our politicians are genuinely good people. Uh, sincerely, they are very good people. They also similarly care. But again, they come from different life experiences. And that's why it's important, critical for us equally to be at the table so that we can also provide our experiences and share dialogue and find out how we can advance along, bringing them along. It's not us versus them. We can't talk through them. We shouldn't talk around them. We should talk with them. And collectively, we need to bring in as many people as possible, not demonize, not be polarized, but bring people together and share these experiences so that when I talk to that senior who is a Republican, for example, and I share with them, I struggle every single day, every single day to put food on the table and to survive. I can't survive. It's difficult. So what, how can you help me? And how can I help you? So we need to be invested in each other's shared success. And that conversation is very important. But again, politics is not it's nasty. It's not scary. It's a democracy. And our democracy is fragile and requires constant TLC, which is why we're all involved. Very well put, Evan, and I agree with reaching out and bringing people together because right now, in a time where a lot of people, a lot of people feel that our country cannot be more divided, it is imperative 
that we don't build ironically metaphorical walls and build bridges to listen to one another and see how we can help. Um, we have a question from, let me see, Elaine, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Sure. So uh, I just want to ask a follow-up to my first question, which is, uh, Evan, during the public health crisis, are Californians able to gather signatures digitally, or do they still have to be obtained in a traditional paper and pen fashion? Yes. So, so is this, are you referring to signatures um, to collect signatures for the, to get something qualified for the ballot? Is that the question? Yes, correct. Yes, yes. It, it, they are required in person. Uh, a, a wet signature uh, it, okay. is required. Okay, thank you. Cool. Awesome. And I have a question in regards to Elaine's question about running for office. Um, I look for other questions here in the chat, but um, what would you say is the real significance of having, um, I would say, a, a legal experience when running for office? Because I feel a lot of people feel like a barrier to entry. Oh, you have to be a lawyer. You have to go to a fancy school where I see like, listen, if you're a scientist, a teacher, like, or in the case of AOC, a middle class member of our community that just truly understands the people. I think that is the kind of um, the experience that we don't see enough in Congress, especially people that are in touch with our realities. Again, um, our, our democracy requires us all to have different life experiences. It does us no good should we have all of our elected representatives in the legislature or Congress all being attorneys uh, and all coming from legal experience uh, or all being uh, brown eyed or whatever the issue might be. We are stronger to reflect the tapestry of our talents in our elected democracy. And that's what's important. So don't be daunted by saying, I must go to an Ivy League. And I'll again, share with you. When I ran at 20 years old, I, I uh, just graduated from De Anza Community College. I went to a community college and then transferred to San Jose State. I worked at a restaurant to pay my way through as well too. Uh, and then uh, got, got elected. And sure, some of the other opponents uh, were older, uh, were homeowners, had children, uh, but do not be daunted by that. I, to, I also was exploring uh, a candidacy for a school board uh, to represent in my local school district. Some of the institutional folks said, well, you don't have any children, so what merit, what is your voice? Why should we elect you as a school board member when you don't have any children? But do not be daunted by these things too. Who, is, who are they to tell us uh, whether or not we are valued or whether or not we have something to contribute? And that's this whole notion about encouraging more engagement and participation as possible. Um, again, it is not as scary as one might think. And I would suggest and argue actually that when you, find yourself, when you, you will find yourself sitting in these positions and are listening to dialogue once you are successful in these elected positions. You'll sit there and actually ponder, you'll think, wow, I'm really honored how I got here. But you also ask yourself, like, you'll scratch your head and you look at some of the other people who are also elected and you say, geez, how did they get here? Um, again, it is not as daunting as you might think. So I'd encourage us all to participate. Uh, thank you very much. We have a question from Jessica. Hi. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about Cal UBI in the California Yang Gang, um, and we're certainly excited to see where it goes in the future. But I'm just curious, what are your other policy priorities going to be in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months? Yeah, thanks, Jess. And thanks again for the uh, for tuning in me to uh, get me on board uh, to, to speak with you. One of the other things I'm really passionate about is changing um, in our institutions and our structures. Uh, so civic engagement is something of, of significant passion of mine. So I've been pushing consecutive years to pass a proposal to lower the voting age to 17. And we will have an opportunity in Proposition 18 this year. So again, please give additional focus this November to Proposition 18. I would love to get your engagement on this. Proposition 18, a yes vote on Proposition 18, would allow 17-year-olds to vote in primary elections should they turn 18 by the general election. So in California, we have our primary elections in March. And that is a long time from March till November. So we want to encourage young people when they're captured in the classroom to be able to look at what a ballot is, to be educated and informed in the classroom. And imagine if we now have an engaged voting poll of young people, high school students, for example, 
Imagine to see the candidates and the politicians going to high school campuses and speaking with a platform that is relevant to young people. And by the way, there are issues that are more relevant to young people. If you look at data and statistics, of course, when you look at that, they understand that climate change is real and the environment is a high priority for them. That's why we saw the Sunrise Movement, uh, that of March for Our Lives, the devastation on firearms and the safety that we need to ensure that we have safe places of gathering with respect to firearms. They know that that is, that is terrible. The issue of healthcare, uh, housing, all these associated issues the young people care about. So I'm passionate about institutional change so that we know that I will come and go. Elected representatives will come and go, but if we can institutionalize it, that's where I think the real change should be. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I have a quick follow-up. Um, where do people go to get more involved in the Prop 18 effort if they're interested? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we are still formalizing the the mechanics around that. This is just sort of feel good. As you may know, many of the propositions on the state ballot have many financial interests and organizational support, but this is a, just a feel good. In other words, it's not a business uh, supported effort or labor uh, supported effort. So this is really a feel good thing. But the League of Women Voters and the League of Conservation Voters, the environmental organization, Rock the Vote, are working to putting together some information. Uh, so I just encourage folks to stay connected with me on Twitter and I'd love to stay connected there to be able to follow the type of actions that could be done with respect to supporting Proposition 18 and or any other issue that you might similarly care about. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm currently seeing no hands unless I'm missing something in the chat. I believe that's it for questions. So first and foremost, Evan. Thank you. Um, so, Ricky, so Ricky just put a question in the chat. Oh, let me see over here. Uh, yeah, Ricky. So basically, um, Andrew's scorecard. Um, I think a big problem with local government is that a lot of people have no idea what they do. Um, so following uh, Andrew's scorecard idea, would you be willing in to create sort of a template for yourself for local government and we could amplify that as something that um, this is what I've done, this is what I'm working towards, these are the really big issues that I'm passionate about kind of thing, and where my progress has been on them. Because I think in, in local government, a lot of times people don't find out about anything until it's already passed and implemented, and they have no idea the work that's actually going into it. Yeah, there's uh, different ways to be engaged on a number of different, a uh, variety of different areas. Um, one could be a scorecard, or one could be a, um, like a voting recommendation on the different propositions on where that might be. So that it's sort of like a cheat sheet that we can easily pass it out to people uh, depending on the level of trust and respect on where, who's giving that recommendation. That we would assume that there might be some other conduits that might have a better sense on helping us disseminate that information and we trust them. So therefore it's sort of a, a, a cheater's cheating guide to uh, basically have a sense of what's going on or to uh, make it more palatable so that the average person can also understand that as well too. So happy to work with uh, the group to disseminate some of that information and look at what these propositions might be and there are some other contexts uh, on also some legislative work that we're also doing as well. Awesome, awesome. And we have a question by Nathan Kemp. Let's see. I think I'm muted. There you go. Yeah, um, so AB5 was passed, everybody loved it, everybody said it's going to reform things. It left huge holes. One of them was that uh, there still are many classifications in the unemployment insurance code as being exempt from unemployment, such as church ministers, campaign workers, substitute teachers, all those people could be out of a job tomorrow and not be able to claim unemployment. And um, some of those exemptions have been in there since the 50s or the 30s. Yeah. So, um, Can you what, frame it as a question, Nathan, please? Oh, sure. How can we call attention to that and have the legislature make that a priority when in, they're only passing their emergency bills right now? 
Um, so if I best understand the question, it's with respect to classification on workers versus independent contractors, is that right? Right. Okay. Uh, yes, so uh, context of this for individuals on the call, there was a recent Supreme Court decision that was made, uh, was referred to as the Dynamex decision. And the court decision was with respect to that of trucking, the trucking industry, and that of some of its classifications on whether or not some of these truckers should be identified as independent contractor, or should they be classified as employees? And the Supreme Court in California deemed this dynamic decision as a very broad clarification and a wide interpretation on employees versus independent contractors. So as a result of that, uh, what you heard as terms of references, so many of the traditional roles, whether you're a cosmetologist or renting out a, a barber or emergency room physician, truckers, musicians, uh, they needed to be classified under the Supreme Court as an employee, that they were misclassified under workers' rights. Um, in California, as you know, we like to help empower to make sure that there's strong worker protections uh, for employees. And for independent contractors, many of those protections do not exist and that are not provided to that of employees. So there was legislation that was passed last year, which is referred to as AB5, Assembly Bill 5, which is AB. So that was Assembly Bill 5, which carved out a number of exemptions uh, for a number of different fields within employment to allow for musician, some musicians and uh, stylists, uh, a wide variety of uh, employee, employee groups as independent contractors instead of employees. And so there are still a number of other industry, uh, industries that still would like to be included to get this exemption to be identified as an independent contractor. And so the state is continually looking at modifications as we speak to include other groups into the identification as independent contractors. Okay. So there's a specific, there's a specific exemptions in the employment code for, for those positions saying that even if you're classified as an employee, you still don't get to qualify for unemployment benefits. And I just, how, other than, you know, we, we can't go to Sacramento and lobby anymore. How do we make, make that an issue? Uh, would you, uh, do, uh, do, are you familiar or aware of who your elected representative is? Yeah, Sabrina Cervantes. Okay. And so the best thing to do is call their, uh, call their office and uh, you should be able to get a live person. And if not, please feel free to uh, message me on, on Twitter so that I can help connect you as well. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you for that. Yeah, and we have one last question from John Ma. Hey everybody, hey Evan. It's John, what up? Again. Yeah, what up? I still have my... you, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I still got a picture in my favorites, my smiling mom and dad after they voted for you in the primary, so proud. <laughs> We'll keep it up for November. Um, yeah, my question is pretty basic, um, but also underneath it's a lot of complexity. So I'll, I'll, I'll be satisfied with your hot take on this one. When it comes to the UBI movements that are happening at the city level, right? We've got these mayors coming out now talking about UBI. We have not just Stockton now, but even Los Angeles with Garcetti. I'm just curious how you see your vision of Cal UBI or anything happening at the state level tying in with that. Um, you know, for those of us who are active at the local level, um, but, you know, obviously see California as, as a big field as well, you know, what should, what could our North Star be? What could, what could we be thinking about uh, with this added layer now of the, of the micro municipal level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The legislative process is really messy, um, but uh, I, I appreciate that, John, the recognition. And the reason why I mentioned that is because it's sort of like, do we start at the local level and then try to push things so that it catches fire? Or do we start at the state level? But in order to start at the state level, we sort of have to get uh, air best, uh, best practices and see some areas of success. So I share, let me share a similar type of issue, policy issue that started at the local level that actually got steam and was, was then finally addressed at the state level. But it only happened because you were seeing wide varieties of cities doing the same thing. Uh, so as, if you can recall sort of maybe within a time frame of five to 10 years, um, on the bag ban, uh, single use plastic bags. The reason why we were seeing this being brought up by local cities, you saw cities 
we have over 370 cities in the state of California. But what we were starting to see was this patchwork of proposals in which multiple cities throughout the state were passing their local ordinances to ban single-use bags. So you could see that how for a company or for the average citizen, it could be complicated and complex to which you go to a store in one side of town and it might not be available. And then just the across the border on another city, it, you can get your plastic bags. So because of that movement, multiple cities and activists were asking to get that passed. And then ultimately the state took action and said, we're just going to pass something like this statewide because of significant support from this at the local level. You also saw the same thing with respect to menu labeling in which in the state of California now, when you go to restaurants and uh, many other places, you can see how many calories there might be. Uh, you saw the same type of movement with respect to smoking. Uh, you don't see smoking in restaurants anymore. Uh, you saw that coming from the local levels. So all of those issues that I just addressed, those policy changes, all happened because they started at the local level. So to John, to your point, I think that this is important that we kind of move in parallel, which is that we continually look at some of the things that are happening at the local level to build public support and recognition and a comfort level around that, while also saying that we know that ideally this should be done at the federal level, but absent that, let's have something at the state level. And absent that, until we get there, let's try to see continuing momentum and getting our local mayors and local cities to adopt this, to build that public support. So I think that those work in tandem, in partnership, to be able to advance the issue. So it should happen at the local level while also happening at the state level to say, and until we see something at state level in an absence of engagement at the state level, we should try to look at some pilots at the local level. So I think they're working hand in hand to which all of us on this call could then activate and engage at the local level to ensure that our local communities are doing so. And I saw some call to action earlier about letters to the editor talking about how the federal stimulus is the same with respect to the policies of helping everyday Americans that we want to see here in California as well. Super, thanks. Awesome, Ivan, thank you so, so much for your time today. We appreciate you having a dialogue with us and we look forward to staying in touch and seeing how we can all move this country forward together. Kurt, cool, thanks so much. Well, again, I appreciate the time. I hope you'll keep me apprised too of things that we didn't get a chance to talk about that we should be championing. And if any of you have any interest or know some other folks that are interested in uh, pursuing public office too, uh, hopefully we can dispel some of the scary things as possible. But I look forward to seeing all of your names very soon on our public ballots because there's all kinds of positions and we need qualified and credible and passionate people to serve in these positions. So I look forward to staying in touch with all of you. Awesome, Thanks, yeah, Evan. I look forward. Yeah, Thank I look forward you. to working together. All right, up next, we have other candidates as well. I'm sure you're familiar with some of these, but I'll pass it along to Cynthia. Hi, so in addition to supporting Evan, California Yangang volunteers are also supporting David Kim from LA County and Liam O'Mara from Orange County. Um, on a side note, David was on the previous call, Evan was on this one, and Liam will be joining our next um, statewide call. Uh, so yeah, these two candidates advanced from their primaries back in March, and they need our help to get elected for Congress in their general election. So if you'd like to start helping either campaign, you can contact Jess or GPS. And we also actually have a phone banking party this upcoming Saturday that Jess will tell us more about. Awesome, yes. And if you guys have seen all those little TikTok or novice videos on Facebook of just Congress people saying amazing things and capturing your attention, let's have that for humanity first and UBI. So let's get these people elected and move this country forward. Upcoming events, Jessica, back at you. All right, so as Cynthia said, uh, we do have a phone banking kickoff party coming up for David Kim this Saturday. We have been working so hard to put this together. So um, I really hope that folks can come and join us. Um, it's gonna be from 12.30 to 2.30 and it's not scary. We're gonna give you a training. There's a script you can follow, but if you're a pro phone banker, you're just really good on the phone, the script is a suggestion. Um, it's gonna be fun. We're gonna share stats during the breaks. Um, David's gonna be there to, um, to say a few words as well. 
Um, and I know that some people approach phone banking with trepidation, but honestly, making that direct appeal to voters is so incredibly important. Um, something Brenna, who used to work for the Yang campaign, likes to say is, you have to talk to voters with your mouth. So yes, all these other things are very important. Letters to the editor, text banking, social media, all that's great, but talking to voters with your mouth really, really helps get us across the finish line. So um, we would love it if you join us for our kickoff event. Um, there will be more events in the future and you'll also be able to sign up to phone bank during other times, but the Zoom parties are really to provide a sense of community, to make the dialer go faster because it dials faster when there's more people logged into it. Um, and to provide a little bit more support and training, um, especially for first time phone bankers, it's really helpful. So if you wanna sign up, um, there is a registration link at the bottom here. Uh, you can also shoot me a message on any of the platforms I'm on or in the chat here, um, and also to Christina or GPS, and we can get you into the volunteer Slack. Thank you very much. Awesome, yes, there's nothing like a good phone making party. If any of you were a part of those during the Yang campaign, you know they can be super fun. Even we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that virtually as well. All right, COVID relief. Kimberly, back at you. Hey, y'all again. How's it going? Um, so if you need some COVID relief help, contact your local mutual aid. Link right here. Um, also, Modern Health Resources. We've part, uh, Humanity Forward has partnered with them in the past, and they've got some cool videos of us participating in some of their seminars. Please check out that link and you will uh, find those videos. Um, they include things like uh, advice on how to cope with stressors, with financial issues at this time and all that jazz. It's really cool. Um, hangs, man. So we do hangs in California every other Sunday. Um, we'll have one tonight after this call and then the following not the next one, but the following Sunday. Um, check our calendar to find those registration links. They're posted there as they are um, uh, created. And then also um, National Humanity Forward hangs. Um, I help to uh, facilitate those. So please come and join us. They're a lot of fun. Um, the registration link for that is here. I will pop that into the chat momentarily and then um, please join us. They are on Tuesday afternoons and Friday in the early evenings. And um, we really just have a lot of fun hanging out, getting together, having some community time, joining in on whatever conversation that sparks our interest and um, yeah, getting to know one another. Um, also, uh, if you feel like volunteering and helping that program out, you can do that. Please reach out to me and I'll get you plugged in. Um, and um, just to help like with facilitating conversations, GPS is awesome with that. He's one of our great co-hosts. So thank you. Uh, it's a lot of fun to get plugged in doing that. And also if you wanna help um, um, with the COVID relief program, um, that is also another one that's really fun to help out with. You just kind of get to help facilitating, uh, giving money out to those who need it. And it's a lot of uh, great heartwarming moments that you can have with people who are in need. So please uh, do what you can, uh, stay safe and be well and reach out when you need help. Awesome, thank you very much, Kimberly. Oh, open up another side, sorry. <laughs> and then we have right now, me, California Mission and Vision, Sean. Hi, so uh, in, in case you're wondering if you don't feel like doing candidate support now or if you're already doing phone banking, another way you can help out is by building out and developing our organization to make long-term changes. And one of our working groups we have going on now is the California Mission and Vision Working Group. We're dedicated to capturing our shared values and vision and our goals to create these statements. Um, we've already done a vision statement. We've put a lot of time crafting into it. Uh, we have it right here. We envision a California that invests in the well-being of its people, measures itself by the strength of its communities, and advances civic engagement for the future of humanity. Um, a big thank you and shout out to all the people that have uh, put so much time and effort into making this. Um, Jess, uh, Elaine, GPS, Kimberly, um, so many people I cannot possibly name. Um, we're also moving on to the mission statement. Um, in case you didn't know, the mission statement is kind of how we're going to achieve this vision for California, that future that, that Evan Lowe described earlier. Um, could we get a slide change? 
Uh, if you'd like to be involved, we meet every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, myself, Elaine, and Kimberly um, can totally direct you uh, to the proper channel. There's also a link below. It's going to give. You, it's going to send you to the California Yang Gang Slack. Um, we love any form of input that you can provide, whether it's during our calls or some of the surveys or feedback forms that we send out. Um, be sure to check in. Uh, we'd love to have you. I think I'm also next, right? <laughs> yes, back to back. Yeah, we could do our structure too. Um, additionally, speaking of you know developing our organization and our gang gang and our culture, we have an org structure group um, that's dedicated to building the overall infrastructure and ensuring that it's consistent with our values, that those humanity first principles and our vision. Um, we have our general framework that we're working on now um, and a sense of our long-term strategy. Uh, myself and Elaine are co-leads for this group. Uh, feel, feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, for this next week, feel, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm on uh, Slack. Uh, yeah, that's probably the best way to get in contact with me. Um, otherwise, look for, look for our channel. There's a lot of details there. Um, and we'd love to have you there too. Awesome, thank you very much, Sean. And up next, we have IT Project Volunteers with Kim. Hey guys, um, my name is Kim, I'm from San Diego. Um, real quick, we have a national project that's ongoing. Um, we are looking for um, volunteer management type um, software that will be hopefully um, a good fit for nationally, all our volunteers and humanity forward. Um, so we're looking at a variety of different applications and if anyone is interested in helping us research those products and evaluate what, what might be um, a good one uh, to implement and to recommend um, to Humanity Forward, then please let me know. Um, you can message me on Slack. You can also email me sandiego.yanggang at gmail.com and I can add you to the channel on the national Slack. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. As you all can see, a lot of opportunities get involved here. And Kim, back at you. Um, yeah, so good ways to get in touch with us. Um, we use the California Yang Gang Slack a lot. Um, we also try to keep everything up to date on the Facebook um, California for Yang. Um, we post like events for our calls and post on the various Facebook groups. It's also a good place to get um, connected locally um, for different regions. Um, you can look for like our regional groups and um, get connected to people through that. Um, but yeah, so just let us know if you have any questions um, or if you're in a particular region and you're looking to connect with people locally. Right, links are right there. And we'll also be linking again the slides on the chat and as well as through an email later so you all can stay in touch. And that is, we're in the feedback links in Q&A. This is just a summary of all the links we presented throughout the meeting as to one nice place for you. Um, we have a feedback form, you know, let us know what you think about the meeting, et cetera. Uh, we have a recurring links for Humanity Hangs and Statewide Con Humanity Hangs. And these are the second Sunday of every month and the fourth Sunday of every month. And these are fixed links. So every time you go in, just go to that link, register, and you'll be good to go. And here's the rest of the links we mentioned earlier. And we also have Francisco from Liam's campaign and wanted to share a little bit about what they're working on right now. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. I uh, wanted to recognize Nathan, who's our director of operations and manager for our team as well. Um, we're really proud and, and pleased to be here tonight. Again, thank you for the opportunity to talk about what Liam's doing. Um, we're running in a very conservative district in Riverside and a portion of um, San Diego County, which is um, going to be a, be a well bet, uh, sorry, <laughs> a bellwether for not only the ideas about universal basic income, but running on a true unabashed progressive platform that will show how the strength of what these ideas mean to everyday people, especially in this really difficult time that we're all in right now. So our campaign is driven not only by these universal ideas that I think are gaining so much traction in our uh, society today, but we're driven also by minorities. We're driven by a youth internship core that is a huge part of our campaign and a part of the big successes we've had in reaching out to different voters in this district. We've been on several coordinated campaign calls with uh, different entities and different groups, such as the California Democratic Party, We've been consistently in the top five. And last weekend, we were in the top two for outreach and calls because we had a very diverse and a broad-based team that spanned not just age, youth, and diversity as well. So we want to add your 
uh, your folks here into this coalition that we have because it is a new way of outreach, not just online, but also bringing different ideas into the progressive, um, you know, speak of politics in our area, which it doesn't happen too much. So that's why I'm very proud to uh, represent Liam here and represent what we're doing. We have a weekly phone bank that happens every Saturday from one to three. And it's something that is, it's fun, it's jovial. We work with a lot of folks that are in high school that are part of our, our youth leadership teams um, that are usually the people that are help, helping manage and actually outreach to other folks to get them involved. So it's not just about reaching out to voters, but empowering people to become the next generation uh, in our politics as well, just as Evan Lowe was saying. We're, we wanna lead by example. And so I really hope that you'll be able to join us and see that leadership and see what Liam's instilled in us that is something that we really wanna change, not just in the way we, we work, but in the way we actually form our campaigns. So I'm gonna put in the chat my email, which is francisco at liamomera.org. And if you would be uh, willing, or if we could set up also a day where we can work together and I invite you to one of our phone banks on a Saturday, that'd be fabulous. Or if a different day works for you as well, that'd be great. And we do also uh, some fun activities too. So. Much like the hangs, we do trivia nights and we do game nights. One of our game nights is coming in the first week of August, which is gonna be sort of a different formulation of Cards Against Humanity. So that would be fun to include you on as well. Students get a reduced and discounted rate and also sponsorships are available for those that are uh, students or low income. So let's not that be a barrier to um, your involvement too. So uh, more and above that, that's uh, Nathan there. He's putting our link in for the trivia night. Uh, and sorry, game night into the chat and then keep this in hand as well. This is actually our dialer link, which is an automated dialer that we use every single weekend from one to three to call. So if you're interested in doing it, uh, please send me an email so that if you can get you the information on the script and how it works, it's very easy to do. And then I think one of the neatest things too that I haven't seen a lot of campaigns do, but we have a Zoom call that happens at the same time the phone bank runs. So if someone is on the phone and they're really getting into the weeds of politics with the voter, they actually can talk to Liam directly on the Zoom and say, hey, Liam, what do you think about this? Or I've got, you know, Bill on the line and he wants to know more about what you feel about UBI. Would you be willing to talk to him? And then we transfer numbers information right there and Liam's on the line talking to that voter. So again, we're leading by example. We're trying to get Liam directly into the different conversations every, every weekend with voters as much as possible because change like Evan said, isn't just about, you know, being there because you have the most resources because we are a low dollar campaign, but it's about sharing our best ideals and leading by example. So I hope you'll join us and see that. Just again, thank you for the opportunity of being here. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with all of you in the future. Awesome, Francisco, very well said. And thank you very much for sharing that. I look forward to working with Liam as um, down the road and as time progresses. So um, this is our opening discussion and Q&A session. If anyone has any questions as to anything that was covered today or any concerns you might have, feel free to just unmute yourself right now. I don't see any Zoom hands, but we'll also keep an eye on the chat. Awesome, it looks like we present our information very effectively to everyone over here. Well, with that being said, and barring any questions, I think this is time for our meeting to conclude and turn into a hang. So oh, Catherine I, has a hand up. Catherine, why am I having trouble seeing Zoom hands here? Oh, Catherine, go right ahead. <laughs> hey, um, since you're kind of wrapping up, I was wondering if uh, Francisco or Liam kind of might describe the best way for potential volunteers to kind of learn about your phone banking, the latest um, times, and kind of when you're hosting those parties, the kind of phone banking parties. Yeah, phone banks happen every single Saturday from one to three o'clock. We're gonna be doing text banking this weekend as well. Uh, what I'm gonna do is drop my email. I'm gonna drop also our through talk link, which is the actual dialer link, and our Zoom call, which is the tech support and training side of the phone bank too, in case you have uh, questions on the technical side of things. And the Zoom is important too, because Liam's always there and he's uh, always talking to us as we're going, just kind of uh, you know, getting in contact with the voters directly from our phone bankers in real time. So it's a neat thing to uh, be a part of. So what I'm gonna do is, um, like I said, drop these links here in the chat. 
If you want um, more information about the game night, we're going to be doing that this coming, I believe it's this coming Sunday. Nathan can talk a little bit about that. And again, don't let um, costs get in your way to let us know if you need some assistance there. We'd be more glad to help you uh, with that as well. So I'm going to put this in the chat. That's my standard email I send out to all the volunteers. You've got everything you need to go right there. And then let's say if there's a day that works for a majority of the folks here and it's not a Saturday, let me know. We can set it up. But we usually ask folks to join in groups because our dialer works better when you have at least five people on. And that allows not only the calls to go more quickly, but it allows you to talk to more people in real time. So more like in other systems in, in days prior, you may have had to get on the phone, dial every single number, click a button on the screen, go to the next number, hang up. Like you're, you're doing five steps just to get to somebody and maybe having a bad time. And it's not a very good outcome. You've talked to maybe five or six people in an hour. But with this, because it's not a made dialer, and maybe you've used one for the end campaign as well, you're actually going to be dialing one number, listening to your phone, and then talking to people directly as they come up on the screen of your computer. So you'll talk to dozens of people in an hour and have real conversations with folks in our district. They're friendly calls. We're calling a lot of our infrequent Democrats, trying to get people that are also liberally minded in the MPP category to come back to the campaign. And we have, um, funny enough, we have a lot of Republicans that believe in UBI, that believe in actually making uh, the, the American dream more attractive and more friendly for folks to attain and the economy going forward. A lot of them are joining our, our team and our, our phone banks too. So um, you know, just for the sheer uh, you know, kind of diversity of what we've created as a campaign, I hope you join us to see that because we do a Q&A after with just Liam where he asks, uh, answers a bunch of questions, open style, ask him anything, and it's awesome conversations and they're really great. So. If it's okay, everybody, I'm going to give the, the if I can, I'm going to give the floor to Nathan and talk about our game night, which is uh, also really fun too. If he's here, not sure if he's still here. Yeah, I'm here. I had to unmute un un myself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So our game night, uh, it's a online version of Cards Against Humanity. Um, we had to be careful in the description because Cards Against Humanity is copyrighted, so we're using an online version called Cards Against Formality. And I used a little bit of Spanish to describe it as <clears throat> manzanas y manzanas, or apples to apples. Um, we're gonna have four or five different rooms, breakout rooms, and then each room will pick their best response to best or worst response to match the card that the ho that the game host picks and then we just go on, go on from there until we go through all the all the cards that are in, in the, the stack uh it's again as francisco said it's don't worry about cost it's really a great chance for everybody to get to, get to know each other we played a trivia night a couple weeks ago and people were just ecstatic to actually have a chime to be on a meeting where there wasn't business. It was just fun. And people made connections with, they, with people all over the county that they hadn't made before. And uh, friends of mine, one was a school teacher and the other one was a, was a tutor. And so they were able to, to hook up in case her students in the fall need, need help with tutoring. You know, it, we've, our Zoom calls are great because they keep us safe, but sometimes they uh, there's not the before and after interaction that we usually have. If, and so a game night allows for that fun interaction. And uh, Dr. Liam also spent time as a bartender, and so he will be unveiling his next Calvert Cure. He's running against Dr. Ken Calvert, and so he, You'll be a, he has spent time with his bartending skills, coming up with various Calvert cures. So that's, that's another bonus for people. Uh, thank you for your Awesome, no, your thank time. you very much. And if you could uh, just for reference, relink the link to the event. I believe it was an Act Blue event you posted on the chat, but just for a reference so people can see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. But yeah, I believe that's it for hands. Can someone confirm there's no more Zoom hands? Because I'm having trouble here seeing Zoom hands for some reason. I don't see any other ones. Okay, awesome. Well, everyone, 
Thank you very much for coming today. It's always a pleasure to see faces old and new. Um, right now, this is going to turn into a super, super casual California humanity hangs. The main purpose of this is just to kick back, have a good time. If you have a beer, pop it up. If you have a bottle of wine, get that corkscrew. Just sit back and relax. We're just here to, um, uh, you know, just talk and relax, of course. Good turnout tonight, too. But yeah, um, of course, you're free to leave right now. We're not holding you against your will. But these are usually pretty fun. <laughs> Oh, Elaine says you're going to turn into uh, DJ GPS. Yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun <laughs> night, wasn't it? It was a great night. We had the first Yang Gang dance party in LA. Oh, yeah, let me stop screen sharing. <laughs>